Hi, and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. Thank you for joining us live tonight for the third installment of the Teach and Play with the Designer. Uh, so that's uh, officially a series because I've done three now. So that's uh, officially a new format on the channel. So that's pretty cool. Uh, as a reminder, we started, uh, I think, last month or even before that with Scott Moore and this war without an enemy. We also had Mark Herman a few weeks ago to play Empire of the Sun, and Sean was with me. That was super fun. So if you want to watch that after, I highly recommend it. And today we're going to do another game with another uh, designer, also in the CDG category, but a bit different. So that's going to be interesting also to see the comparison uh, with what we've uh, played here before on the channel. And we're going to play Europe Divided by David Thompson. One of the hottest designers right now, uh, designer of Undante Normandy, Plavros House, and War Chest, and so many more games. Hey, David. Hey, how are you? Thanks for Fine. having me. Uh, very happy to have you again. So that's uh, really, thank you for taking the time. Um, and also, I'm, I'm super happy to have you to to uh, to play this game specifically, because uh, I think it's a really... Uh, it's a really interesting approach to 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 card driven games and as you know i i tend to like those um, those those types of systems i've talked a lot about it on the channel i'm also designing games that are card driven so that's obviously something that i'm interested in and i really felt like this one had something different so i thought it was also super cool uh to have you on the show to to talk about it um, maybe before we start, there is one thing that I would like to say, and that that uh, this game was provided to me by the publisher, Phalanx Games, uh, so uh, so that you know, uh, it's a promo copy. Um, it's not a paid content, though, so that's something also that is important to specify, but I think it's important to say it also because um, I'm really happy when publishers also make the effort of supporting content creators. Um, I wanted to play this game. Finance was up for it. Uh, it was a it was a good thing for us to like. We went came to an agreement that was pretty cool, and I want uh, I want to thanks them for that. That's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it for my intro and my caveats and uh, and explaining how uh, <laughs> how much I've been I've been bought by the uh, by the publisher. So uh, Europe divided uh, card driven game as I was saying released last year. Uh, end and end. Uh, I was wondering where did this the idea of making that game came from? Oh yeah, so the, you you mean the game thematically, right? Yeah, the game exactly. concept. Yeah. So I, uh, without getting into a ton of detail, I um, have been working first in the Air Force and then in the U.S. Department of Defense for about uh, I guess twenty twenty five years, something like that. And my whole career has uh, either been it's it's at least been tangentially associated with like for, uh, Russia or the former Soviet republics, that kind of stuff. So um, even at times where I wasn't directly involved, um, there was at least some ties. So I have a lot of um, professional background in it. Uh, I also, for my um, thesis, I wrote on uh, regime stability in Azerbaijan. So I have a special interest in the Caucasus region. So I would just say that, you know, both my personal and professional life have, have been interested in um, Russia, the former Soviets, um, Eastern Europe. So, yeah. So it was an area. It's an area that I wanted to explore. Um, I started conceptualizing the design probably in the 2015 time frame, and yeah. um, I wanted to explore the post Cold War period specifically, right? So there's there's a few games now on the Cold War. Obviously, the biggest being Twilight Struggle, um, but I thought that an area to to explore that really hadn't been much, nothing, not much had been done on it, was the post Cold War struggle between Russia and Western Europe on influence in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus. Um, and if you think about the timing, so I was working on this, like I said, around 2014, 15, um, we had seen the Russia, Georgia conflict. We had seen, you know, obviously, um, uh, what happened in Crimea, we, we saw yeah. Eastern Ukraine. So it was very, you know, that I think we, and, and at the time I was living in the UK, right? So it was just very near to me what was going on again, both professionally and personally. And that's actually something that I wanted to ask you about because I knew that when you said that you started working on 2015, I know that at that time you were living actually in Europe, and did it have any impact on the on the design itself? So you were saying that it was you were feeling nearer to it. Was it also linked to maybe what you were working on at the time, or 
I have to be very careful that uh, any game, and you'll it's very seldom will you see working on like a, a modern design, right? Uh, mm. war, war games or whatever, because I have to be careful that my game designs don't touch too closely to my work, right? For yep. classification reasons, all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't work in the military political side of, of stuff. I do other other parts of the business. So I just have to keep those two things separate. So I would say it was more from my personal interest um, in this case, right? As far as, again, Russia's resurgence, if you will, sort of post 2008. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously living in the UK, you're a lot closer to it than you are in the US, right? Yeah, obviously. And uh, and the game covers, uh, so what period specifically? Because you have two big phases in the game and you have basic, it's split in two, maybe the, the 90s and early 2000s, and then you have the second phase that is uh, with the really the strong resurgence, uh, um, right? Uh, closer to 2010 up to today. Yeah, so you would you would break the game that just like you said, the break the game is broken down into two periods. The first period you can think largely as European expansionism, right? So the Cold War ends, so we're talking right at around 1990-91 time mm. period is when the game begins, um, and you can see that reflected in a lot of the events. And you see a big push towards the EU and NATO expanding, right? They're expanding into Central Europe, expanding into East, Eastern Europe. Um, you're seeing countries added to the EU, countries either added to NATO or becoming partnership for peace um, members, etc., cetera, um, or, or NATO aspirants. So you'll see the first era of the game is all about that sort of European expansionism. And then the, and, and you'll also, what you'll see largely on the uh, former Soviet side is you'll see echoes of a lot of those, like as soon as the Soviet Union fell, there were a lot of, you know, the, the original Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, um, the the original sort of uh, conflicts in Ab Abkhazia and South Ossetia, places, you know, the flashpoints. And so you'll see those early on in that period. And then in the second half of the game is essentially the Russia-Georgia war on, so 2008 on, uh, ending, and it, I think, I, I can't remember exactly because it's been a couple of a few years since I finished the design. I think it's like 2018 uh, is the last event. And one one funny thing about this game is when we ran the Kickstarter, there was a script, a stretch goal for an expansion that would have been um, potential future events, right? So it mm. would have been a handful of extra headline cards for things that I thought were very likely to happen in the next handful of years. And one of those was a resurgence of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. So there's actually a headline card that exists as a promo that we never, we never made because we didn't meet the stretch goal, but it actually anticipated the, you know, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. So that was just an interesting aside. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and those headline cards are what I'm showing now. So it's, um, so it's cards that you can see that would be objectives that, uh, that, that players resolve during the game uh, that come up at different time. And regarding uh, regarding the design specifically, I was actually wondering about something. Um, I was wondering about overall your relationship with CDGs. Uh, do you play a lot of them? And my second question is obviously, what do you feel were the games that inspired you the most in the way you approached uh, Europe Divided? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, people are going to, to cringe when I say this, but when I first started uh, conceptualizing this game, so maybe as early as 2014, certainly into 15. I don't think, uh, I want to make sure that I say, what I say is true. I don't think I'd, I'd actually played any CDGs. Um, I certainly knew about them, right? I knew about Twilight Struggle, etc. cetera. Um, but it was more an inspiration from uh, games that are not CDGs as like the very archetypical CDG, but more like games that are driven by cards. So, I would think that my personal influence going into the original design was more from like a few acres of snow, yeah. uh, multi-use cards, right? Versus a, CD, a proper CDG. Now, since that time, I've become a huge fan. Um, my personal favorite are the smaller, tighter, so like Watergates and 13 Days um, versus the longer ones. But I mean, yeah, I've, I've fallen in love with the, the genre. But now I will say that my design partner, Chris Marling, uh, he is much more a Euro guy. He's not a war gamer really at all. But, um, but of course, he, he knew Twilight Struggle. And so throughout the entire design process, we had this weird situation where we would be talking about the game and, he, and he'd be bringing influences from the, what he knew as a Euro game player with those sort of crossover games that he would be bringing to the, to the discussion. So that was an interesting relationship. And that's really interesting because 
playing it, uh, when I first learned about it, I, I was expecting it to be uh, way closer to, uh, to to Twilight Struggle. Wait a minute, I have a small light problem. Excuse me. So, uh, that's, it's, it's a live stream, so this is bound to happen. Uh, so I was, ex I was expecting to, um, uh, I was expecting the game to, to be closer to Twilight Struggle or tighter for Twilight Struggle. Uh, and, and when I played it, I was like, whoa, that's radically different from what I expected. And the thing that came to mind as soon as I started playing and figuring it out uh, was this game that is actually inspired mm. by uh, yep. uh, a few acres of, of, of snow, so hands in the sea, more similar system. And I didn't expect that, that at all. And it was, I must say, a pleasant surprise because even though I love CDG, I love the idea of, of, of exploring different ways to use cards and everything. So I thought that maybe in a way you not being that exposed too much to that to that genre gave something different to the uh, to the game. Uh, I, I think so. I think it was a benefit, honestly, that because uh, you know, had I had I been into the CDG um, genre going into this, it probably well, it certainly would have influenced the design, right? And so, there's nothing wrong with that. That would have been totally fine. It would have been a different game. And I think that I think it, at least in some ways, it 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 was advantaged by not having that. Yeah, uh, and just so we have a uh, so first of all, we have a question by Alan, and I want to say hi, Alan. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for everyone that's actually joining us live. Uh, if you're watching us after the fact, just know that usually I add some time codes uh, in the description. So if you want to go th straight to the playthrough, you can do that. We're going to still talk a bit before about the game before before actually playing it. And Alan is asking uh, a question about the the time period. So we're saying uh, 90s up to 2015, 2018. Yeah. So yeah, definitely uh, post-Soviet era. Yeah, and it's uh, worth it's worth telling play. So yeah, it's, it's right as the the end of the Cold War, so the Soviet Union is dissolved. Um, one player takes on the role of of Russia, right, and the other player takes on the. And this is an interesting part of the game. One player takes on the role of both the EU and NATO, and so um, that player who takes on those two has to deal with the if you, bureaucracy and the sluggish sort of inter interaction between those two different very different entities. Um, so a lot of the, fo well, all the focus is on influencing Eastern Europe, Central Europe. So what you'll see is a lot of those, uh, tension points, right? So what was happening in the Balkans, the Baltics, et cetera, right as the, um, Soviet Union broke up is that's what the game is all about. Yeah. And actually as a follow-up to this, there is a, a question from Pierre that I think is a, quite interesting. He's asking, um, uh, why is the game focused on, on a two player dynamic? Because that's something that you could. Uh, that is an interesting design choice. Was it more uh, game driven, or more it more more uh, based on your own research or analysis of the geopolitical situation? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I is hmm, well, okay. Well, I want to make sure I'm following this. The duality of Europe, meaning meeting Western Europe, NATO, EU, or or between Russia and Western I, Europe. I think there is a. a, a May, if maybe I, I'm interpreting the question, but I'm 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 guessing, does it necessarily make sense to see it as two powers against each other, or could there be a dynamic where you would actually have three powers, NATO, the EU, yeah. and Russia? Okay, uh, yeah. like something like yeah. So I think I, I, that's how I interpreted the question too. Mm. So it's interesting. It's a very good, a very astute question. It's a very interesting question because it leads into the very earliest concepts of this game. Originally, I envisioned this game as being a three-player game. One player would play the EU, one player would play NATO, and one player would play Russia. And the entire point of that was to make the the EU player and the NATO player have um, asymmetric, not really goals, right? The goal would be the same, but their interaction would be very asymmetric, and there would, there would be a lot of tension there. And I wanted to tell that story of, you know, how do the EU and how does NATO, how do they interact? Um, how, how bureaucratic are they individually? And then when they have to, to interact to, together, quote unquote, if you will. And what I found was, is the better way to tell that story is to make a single player struggle managing both of those entities by themselves. Because I think it tells you as a player, you're struggling between balancing the two. I think that actually communicates it better. 
And then there is uh, one last question from the audience uh, that is around uh, is focusing specifically on Europe, which I think also connects with uh, with your question that is uh, talking about the, the scope and the, and the players. Uh, did at you did at any point you you consider actually expanding the scope and uh, and look into a Central Asian state that was also part of the USSR, where there is of course also struggles around uh, uh, preserving a form of. Uh, influence over there for for the actual uh, Russia and actually tying it to the to the to the tongue in cheek comment that I was making on Twitter earlier today talking about the Primakov uh, doctrine which is actually uh, covering uh, those states and also the relationship with India and and China um, yeah did you it, was it something that you consider and I I never I never considered it not because I don't think it's a good idea I, I think that there's a couple of reasons there's a practical reason where I know this area much better. Right, and so um, I would have needed to do a lot more research, which would be which would be fine. Uh, so, but that aside, I think um, if it was all a single game, that it turns into this more global affair, which is not. I wanted it to be um, a smaller scope than that. I think um, I think it's absolutely a, a good idea for a game, and maybe maybe it's just a different game that focuses more on the the Central Asian you know region, right, in its geopolitical situation. Um, if it if it was all of that, uh, I think it could make for a good game. I think it'd be a much bigger, longer game, right? Yes, but, yeah, definitely. That would be a different game, but that's yeah. maybe a discussion for after we've played the game, uh, because I would like to ask you about the projects that you're working on and uh, sure. and stuff like this. And I see some questions going in that direction. Sure. Uh, so maybe I'm gonna bring the the game to the to the stream. So for people who are watching us and are wondering what platform we're using, we're using Tabletopia. Uh, so I'm laughing because <laughs> David and I were talking about Tabletopia just before our stream, and we hope that everything is going to be OK. It should be OK. It's just that none of us have been using it for a while. Uh, I, I guess that we both use it for design, designing. We both use TTS. And for playing, I would favor Vassal. I, I'm a Vassal guy. I, I love Vassal <laughs> when it comes to playing. And, and then I'm more used to TTS. But yeah, Tabletopia is a bit out of my zone of comfort. So if you see me struggling with the comments and everything, please don't don't be too mean. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the same goes for me. I, I Like I told you, I think I used this a couple of years ago, once or twice. And it's uh, I, I live, I spend way too much time in TTS for both designing and playing. So I know it's, it's like secondhand, but, uh, but this is a, a bit different. So yeah. Good, uh, but then I guess we can probably uh, jump into uh, into the on, into the uh, the actual teach, uh, and maybe we can talk a bit about the uh, the different elements that are on the board. Or I don't know what's your favorite way of uh, of teaching the game, but I'm all ears, David. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so how, however we can approach this a few different ways. I mean, one thing we could do is just start with the setup, right? Because it's it's not set up now. So is that is that worth just kind of going through? going through the, the mechanics of setting it up and teaching that bit of it? Yeah, sure. OK, so um, the first thing we do is the headline cards. Now, Fred, you, you showed them off a little bit, but we could probably talk about them just a little bit as we set that up. But there's a deck of headline cards. Um, and each of the headline cards, you can see they're color coded. They're either going to be red, meaning it's, it's a uh, headline card that favors Russia. It scores for Russia or green, and that means it's a headline card that scores for the uh, for the Western Europe player. I'll probably just say Europe player. So no, no, keeping in mind that it's you're representing really Western Europe, quote unquote, if you will, for the most part. Um, and so there's some some things on the card. There's some historical text at the bottom. That's not super important. Um, the main thing is the top feature there, and that's just the conditions that you have to meet to satisfy the headline, and then the victory points underneath it. And every once in a while, you'll see something besides the victory points. We can talk about that later. But mostly, it's scoring victory points and meeting the conditions. And that's what you're going to want to do. And we can we can talk more about the specific conditions later on. But yeah, of course. And just to to illustrate this was as an example, so I'm focusing here on the on the Armenia card. And just for, for the people watching us, basically, it says that if I, my influence in Armenia plus the number of army is strictly superior than uh, uh, NATO's influence, then I will score two victory points. We'll go into the details, but just so you have an idea, the top part here is the condition, and uh, this is a visual reminder of where it is. That's the title, and that's the number of VP that you're going to be granted. Yep, that's right. And like I said, there's you can see like you know what what it's 
thematically representing it's the the first Nagorno Karabakh war and when when it took place the historical text etc. So um, the headlines we we talked about this a little bit earlier. This game is divided into two eras, so the headline cards are divided similarly. So we to set up the game we need to set up the headline cards for the first era. And so we've the game starts with uh, one in play for each side, a Russian one and a, and a Western Europe one. But the rest of the deck, we're going to take some cards out that you don't play with at all, right? So you'll see, you'll never see some cards. And then the rest of that first period deck, um, there will be 12 remaining cards. And so we will we'll shuffle those up so that you have an equal chance of getting EU or Western Europe and um, Russia cards. And then we deal out three of those to each of us. So I think... I think the deck is already built, no? I think it is, yeah. I yeah, think so I think we can probably draw three of us each... Uh, okay. Oops, and I draw three. I don't have no idea how I did that, but I but I did. <laughs> okay, and so then we move. This is going to be the worst part. We got to move this out of the way. <laughs> oh, you exactly know what? No, I think they've already set up. Yeah, they've already set up the yeah. second period. So so just for people following along, so we would have set up um, the first era, and then the second era has. Uh, its own set of cards. We would we would take some out. We would shuffle it together, and then we would put the first era back on top of the second era. Yeah. So that's that's setting these headlines cards up now. So what's importantly what's happened here is, um, like I said, we have an equal chance. There's an equal distribution of of Europe cards and Russia cards, and so um, let's say that Fred is playing Russia, and Fred has. Russia cards in his hand, he's going to have the opportunity to know that those cards are in his hand and prepare himself as much as he has time to do. And this game is, you're very, very tight in terms of actions. So mm. you won't be able to try to go over everything. But um, the good news is if he's got Russia, card, Russia headline cards in his hand, he can build up whatever those requirements are ahead of time and try to prepare for them. And uh, it's possible, depending on how the flow of the cards are, that he may be forced to play a Europe card and allow me to go for it. Uh, or he may be able to 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 hold on to it and never play it out. Regardless, the way the game is is set up, the cards are set up. There will always be an equal number of uh, headline cards for each side, um, for for each player. So you have an equal opportunity to to have events to score against. So now we've we've put some headline cards into play to start with. We've got a hand of ones that we can we're going to play later on. And so um, the next thing we do is the action cards. So. Um, generally speaking, the way the action card, well, for, for sure for the Europe side, the action cards are all based around uh, a member of NATO or the EU or both, right? So you see I flipped over the Sweden card here, and it's it's got, you know, where it's located, um, the initiative value at the bottom, and then actions it could take here along the left side. Now, You'll note all of those actions are in yellow. Sweden's a member of the EU, but not NATO, so it can't take any NATO actions. But if we look at Denmark, Denmark's a member of both, so we can take you know NATO and EU actions. And uh, I don't know, Fred, do you think now's a good time to just kind of briefly go through those actions, or should we do it as we're playing? What do you think? I think it would be probably easier to do it uh, as we play, because okay. I think that might be a lot of information. But I would yeah. just say that overall, uh, maybe explaining the autonomy, anatomy of the card and saying that what you see on the left band here is actions that uh, David is going to be able to take. But you're going to pick one of those. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're going to have, we're going to be playing throughout the course of this game with a hand of four cards. So you're going to have four cards. You're going to pick two of those cards to play, and you're going to pick the two that you want to play at the same time. So let's go, you know, let's say that Fred and I have driven, drawn our hands. Um, I want to play Spain, and I want to play Denmark. I'm going to pick those out. Fred's going to pick his two cards out, and then we're going to announce the sum of our initiative. So I have a 10. Let's say Fred has a 3. So a couple of things about that. The, the, the stronger the card is, the higher its initiative value. So the best cards in the game, the cards like the UK, France, Germany, those are going to be the most valuable cards. They're going to have the highest initiative. Um, you, this is not a game where you could win initiative and choose to go first or second, right? If you, if you win initiative, you're forced to go first. Mm. Usually in the game, and especially late in the game, you want to go second. You're going to want to be able to respond. So there's a, a, a strong tension in this game when you choose initiative about do I play my best cards because I want them because they're really good, 
or do I play bad cards because I desperately want to go second to react to what my opponent's doing? Um, and then, like as Fred said, to, to the, all the actions here are, are, are along the left, you're only going to take one action. So even though Spain and Portugal has a ton of different things it can do, you know, seven different potential actions, you only get to choose one of those. So on your turn, you're going to pick two cards, you're going to play initiative, decide the order, and then you're going to play one action from each of the two cards you chose. So for, for purposes of setup, we would um, uh, draw four cards each to start our, our starting hand. Yeah, and just so, so you know, uh, I have already four cards uh, in my hand. So those are going to be my four starting cards. Uh, so I already have a few of those, and I'm showing them so you can see, yeah, they have different initiative value. And then I have three advantage cards. Uh, and maybe you want to talk a bit about the advantage cards. Yeah, so the advantage cards are, um, they're, they're special, they're, they're cards that let you do all kinds of special things, things that are different from other, you know, the regular actions you can take in the game. So I'm just going to flip over one, for example. So this US, U.S. presidential tour. So first of all, every advantage card has the same three characteristics. It has a victory point at the top, it has money, and then it has, it's just a little symbol for text saying, hey, there's a special action. So you have three choices with this card. You can, and, and I should say, we're going to draw three at the beginning. We'll keep two. I'm sorry if you said that, Fred. We'll keep two. Um, and then the second error, we'll do the same. We'll draw three cards, pick two to keep. So if you don't use the card at all, if you just don't choose to not use it ever, you're, you'll score a victory point when it's time to score. Uh, at any time, you can cash this card in for three money, and money can be very tight in this game, especially for mm. Russia. Um, or you can use it for a special action. Using it for a special action does not count as one of your two actions in a turn. So it'll tell you some some cards play at different times. So you just basically read the read the special power and um, read when you know when it tells you when it instructs you to do whatever it is on the card. Good. So as uh, David was saying, so I started with my four action cards. Uh, I have two advantage cards in my hand because the third one I discarded in the discard just over there, and I have my. Uh, three headline cards. And I'm not going to be looking at those for a while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip them and I'm going to put them on the side and I will draw them a bit later. So I, I have a bit of... My hand is a bit less cluttered and I can focus on what I want to do right now. Okay. And I know that the upcoming objective for me, and that's not going to be resolved until uh, turn four, right? Yeah. That first headline. Yes, that's correct. So um, there's a track here. It keeps track of two things. It's the uh, the turn that we're on, right, one through twenty, and it also keeps track of some special things we do at the end of each turn. So we can see at the end of turn two, uh, we will shift these headlines, and then we'll each pick a new headline to put into play, and then we draw a new headline card, right? And so what it means is that in turn two, these advance at the end of turn four, we resolve them. So that's when we'll, we will have four turns for every card that's ever put into play um, to prepare to, to complete those requirements for it. So you're going to have Western Balkans, and I'm going to have Armenia. So very different objectives. Yeah, and let's just remind, and you mentioned this briefly, but we'll remind folks what, what those... They're similar objectives in this case. So Western Balkans were, were fighting for the Bosnian War. For me to meet my objectives, I have to have an army there, and I have to have more NATO influence than you have Russian influence. So now's a good time to talk about armies oh, so, and influence, right? Ah, okay. So the army is a requirement. So you need an yes. army and then have more influence than I do. Yep. That's right. Okay. Yep, that's right. So, so let's talk about uh, influence first. So influence is represented by these dice. So... For me to win the Western Balkans, I need to have more NATO influence, not equal to, but specifically more. How do we change the dice? Uh, so if you right click on it, uh, you can click on a number and then you will say, for example, four. Okay. So it, yeah. Yeah. So if, if that, um, 
putting myself at six. <laughs> okay. They, yeah. Okay. Well, this is good. Example, for, right? for the example, and then I would decrease it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So for the example, so let's say that this was the example. And now this is actually a really good example. We can talk through a few things here. Uh, it comes up, the end of turn four comes up. We would check to see if this is true. I needed an army here and I need to have more NATO influence than you had Russian influence, which I, I don't, right? You have more NATO, you have more influence than I do. So I don't meet those requirements. The card would get discarded and I don't score two points. Now, let's talk about what armies do in this game. There's not really conflict, right? Armies represent the mi military presence in a location. And if you think about it, with the exception of crazy situations like Russians being in, you know, Transnistria and Moldova with us having a small NATO presence, there's very few examples of NATO and Russia coexisting in le legitimately in individual countries. So you can't have armies coexisting. Um, the other thing is that the presence of an army will mac, uh, limits the amount of influence a player can have. And so Russia can go up to five influence here, but Russia could never actually get to six if there was a NATO army. So if, if Russia w w had a six influence here and I move my army in, the army actually goes away and, and the influence goes down to five. Uh, if I already had an army here and you had a five influence, you could not go up to yeah. six. You're limited. And so the, the tactic I would probably do then if I wanted to win this is I'd put an army here, it would stop you from going to six, and then I could come in and I could go up to six influence, right? And then I could try to win that. So um, there's no, like I said, there's no such thing as combat. So if two armies ever uh, would occupy the same place, they are both just, just um, removed from the game. So, and you'll see that um, the Europe player oftentimes has requirements that are EU requirements or NATO requirements, or sometimes uh, both. So we'll, we'll play through the turns. Um, we will follow the headlines. We'll, after turn, after uh, turn four, we'll start scoring a headline every two turns until we get up to turn 10, and that's when we do the first scoring period. And so we're scoring in two ways. We're scoring um, the cards that we, the, the headline cards that we've scored, um, we score influence, right? And so for every country that you have um, dominance, meaning a six influence, you um, score a victory point. So that's those are the main two ways to score. And then I guess the last thing we really need to talk about is when we, I mean, there's a, you know, there's other little small things here and there, but major, major things is when our influence gets to a, do you remember, is it a five? It's been a while since I played. What are you? Uh... Uh, when you take a contested region. Oh, yes. So it's uh, up to when you reach a five. So when a five, you reach yeah. a five, and this is where it, it, it becomes, uh, so for people who've played a few acres of snow, this is this is where this mechanic comes in. Is Yeah. So when you reach a five or a six, uh, the faction will take significant, enough influence to add the card of that specific country to their deck, right? That's that's right. Yep. Yeah. So so let's go back to this Balkans example. So if I had, um, if I increased my influence to a five, then I'm going to take the Western Balkans card. Now, an interesting thing about this game is that uh, it's not, it, it, that might sound kind of like deck building, right? Because I'm adding cards to my hand. But typically when you think of, or to my deck, when you think of deck building, you're oftentimes making your deck better. In this case, that's almost certainly never the case, right? If you think about the Western Balkans, the Western Balkans card is not going to be a great card. It's going to have problems. And so you're increasing the size of your deck, which you're going to have to do because we're going to be fighting for control of these places. Um, you're increasing the size of your deck, but you're adding bad cards to it, if you will. Um, so let's just look at this card. So it has EU and it has NATO um, actions, but they're very weak actions. And so there's another tension point in the game about, well, if I go into to the Western Balkans and I increase my influence to try to score there, I'm going to take that card and I'm going to have to deal with that for the rest of the game. And that's disproportionately bad for the Europe player because um, a lot of these are, uh, well, there's a, there's a special thing for the Europe player. So the Europe player, if they take the Western Balkans, can only take actions from this card where they have dice that are equal to five or more. So if this was my situation, 
I had five NATO influence, one EU influence. I can't use the EU powers on this card. And so what happens, and this is especially true in about the second period of the game, you get these contested regions, you don't have both influence, and so they start blocking off your ability to take the actions you need when you need them. So it becomes very difficult to balance that for the, for the Western Europe player. Okay. But I guess we can probably jump into it, and when we start playing the cards, we're we're gonna have the opportunity to explain what each symbol does, and maybe explain what do we choose to do on on each of those cards. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so as David was saying, we're at the beginning of a turn. We're gonna we're gonna pick two cards and place them face down, and then we'll uh, we'll say to the other player what is the sum of the initiative value of both those cards. There is one thing that I realized that is not on the board. And I think that might be this, uh, because I, I don't think there is a, a turn counter on the. Ah, yeah, good call. If we can, yes, my God. It is so painful. <laughs> yes, OK. It is very painful. <laughs> oh, I did it. Good. Uh, now I can actually uh, look at my cards. Uh, so I'm I'm just gonna think out loud here, um, and and David is gonna pretend like he's not hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, but basically, what as you can see, I only have three coins. Three coins is not a lot. On the other side, um, you can see that David has a lot of money, like he has eight. And cards are gonna be useful to place those influence dice. You're gonna have to play to pay two coins uh, to place um, to place a die on one area. So at this stage, I could only place one die, and I would be already out of cash. Uh, building armies cost uh, money. Moving them around, if I want to move them long distances, uh, cost me money. So everything is a bit expensive, and I'm super poor. But I have this thing here uh, that will help me. And if you can see, there is the a symbol on the left. It has. Uh, it's pretty smart, actually, David. The money <laughs> is uh, represented by a coin, so very easy to figure out. But that that four coin here is actually showing that if I use that card for the action of generating income, I will generate four uh, coins. And I think I'm going to do that uh, because I want a bit of cash to start with. And then I know that I have time for that uh, whole Armenian situation. Uh, I'm a bit worried because there is Turkey that has an army uh, of NATO that is just next to it. So that might be a problem. So I'm thinking maybe maybe I could give David something to do and put him a bit of pressure on the Bosnian war there. Maybe I could do that. That's a pretty good card. Hmm. I'm looking at what my other cards are doing just to sh see. Quatre, cinq, sept, deux. Okay, yeah. So don't worry if you hear me speak French is that I'm counting. So yeah, <laughs> for people in the <laughs> chat, don't it's like I cannot count in English. I need to. I need to count in. Uh, I need to count in uh, in French. That's the only way for me. Wait a minute. So, uh, so we'll both declare our initiative levels for the two cards that we decided to play. And those are going to be the two cards that we're going to have to play. So there is no funny business here. And we'll play the both of them in a row. It's just that who's going to play first is going to depend on the initiative value that, that we have. And I have a 12. I have an 11, so you'll go first. Ugh. If there's ever a tie, the Europe, the Europe player has to go first. Yeah. Uh, did I lie? No, I didn't. I, I had it out. I was like, <laughs> was I at 14? No, no. So I'm, I'm playing the president. Uh, and the president is an interesting card. It lets me do quite a few things. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in and, and, and maybe explain um, the symbols. So the first symbol that you see on the top left here, uh, where you have uh, a die with a 1 and with the, with the disc with a 2 underneath. So the disc is the cost. Um, that you would have here. Uh, and that means that I would pay two, I could use that card to pay two coins to place uh, one die on any contested region. 
The other symbol that you have that is plus and a value is the number of increment that I can give to a die that is already on the board. Uh, the coin that you see here uh, is telling me if I play this card for income, this is the number of income that I'm going to have. Uh, and then the other symbol here that you have, the, the pentagon with the, the star on top, is building an army. So I could pay two to build an army in Moscow. And the final symbol is to move armies. And because that's also something that we found out with David, is the Tabletopia module is using all their uh, artwork. Uh, that is not completely clear here, but what the zero plus means, means that the first movement of an army is going to be free. Every additional step that you're moving into is going to be cost you one. So you can move across the whole map if you want it. It's just that it's going to cost you for each space that you're going to go through. And of course, NATO army cannot enter uh, Russian space, and Russian armies cannot enter uh, Europe or Western Europe spaces. So in that specific case, uh, I'm going to use the president to generate some cash uh, because I desperately need a bit of money. So I'm going to put this in the discard and get four coins. And I'm going to get them here. So one. Oh, my God. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, three four. the good thing is that everything is so painful that it's really hard to cheat with the, the <laughs> like with TTS yeah doable uh, and then I have a southern federal district and here in that specific case there is no new symbol because the president had all of them for me I think except the special action but this is something we we talk a bit more about later and on this one I'm going to use the action to place influence so I'm going to pay two uh, to place some influence and because I'm a bit mean, uh, I'm going to place it uh, in Western Balkans. Not really that I'm interested in Western Balkans right now. I'm more interested in them just because uh, they are an interest of uh, Western Europe. So it's mostly to be annoying, which is usually <laughs> my preferred strategy. So I'm going to take that die and place it in Western Balkans and start build up my influence there. So that's it for me. And now David is going to show his card if I manage to oh god wait a minute I'm trying to properly <laughs> discard that card uh please please I'm praying I'm calling to the gods of tabletopia oh god yes it's good oh and I can see that Scott is here hey Scott nice to see you and no Scott I have fast decision making it's just that I'm walking through my thought process for the benefit of people watching the show you see how I was actually talking about um, Scott to David before the yeah. show, saying he was extremely mean and sometimes uh, brutally rude. <laughs> and, and this is a perfect example of that. Scott is a... Uh, Keep a, going, Scott. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just be mean to only Fred. <laughs> okay, so so I, I had an 11. I've got um, Italy and Benelux. And so both of them have the ability to take a wide range of action. They're both pretty good cards. Um, at the top, we have now the, a lot of these symbols are going to look very similar because, and, and man, wow, the tabletopia color, yellow color is really difficult to read. Yeah, but at it's, the top, it's really tough. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's um, placing a EU influence at a place that doesn't already have influence. Then the next one is increasing it by whatever the value is. So in ca these cases, they both uh, Italy increases by four, Benelux by three. Um, taking money, uh, placing NATO influence, increasing that influence placing a nato army and then moving a nato army now one one thing that's true about this game is it's a short, sort of a shorthand uh thing to remember anytime you're ever placing a new thing on the board whether it's you're placing an army or you're placing influence for the first time you always have to spend two money um and then the only other way you're really made usually spending money in the game is when you move your army past that first space so I'm going to use Benelux to spend two money to place NATO influence. And I'm going to place it in Western Balkans. And then I'm going to use Italy to increase its influence by three. So I'll increase, increase it to four. So aggressive. So aggressive. Now, if, <laughs> now had I, obviously, had I been able to inf increase it to five, I'd be taking the... Um, the Western Balkans card. Yeah. And that's it. That's the first turn, right? So we just advance the turn marker. We know that at the end of this next turn, turn two, we're going to advance the headline card. So we'll want to prepare ourselves for that. There might be, we might be 
taking actions to prepare for an event that hasn't been displayed yet, uh, we draw two new cards. Yeah. And you see here, there is already something interesting is that uh, you might not see that yet, but like if you look, I only have one card left uh, in my uh, in my uh, in my draw pile, uh, whereas uh, David has seven. So going through, so for people who are used to play deck building games or uh, a few acres of snow or games like this, so you can see that David starts with a pretty significant pile, meaning that like his good cards are going to be diluted a lot more within his deck, whereas my my deck is going to be way sharper, and I would be able to to cycle through it way faster. So I don't have a strong incentive to take one of those countries just yet. Uh, good. Oh, and I think there was a question from Alan here. Uh, so he was pleased with the graphics. And I think that's actually one of the things that I really like also about the game. The graphics are extremely modern and very different from from, from other games. Even if it's, it's actually changing over the last few years, there is more and more a uh, very modern approach to graphic design in, in, in Wargaming, but those ones are, are really great. But he was wondering about the um, uh, the woman's face that you see on the cards and that you actually see on the box uh, here. I'm just going to show the box here. So that's the... Uh, yeah. yeah. He was wondering if there was a specific story behind it or... Yeah, yeah I don't think so. So I think that... Um, so I think that I totally agree. The arts, the graphic design, the art's great. I love it. Um, I don't think that there's a specific... Uh, story behind her. I mean, it was it was definitely Phalanx's idea to go with the what I think is a really striking graphic. I mean, some people said they don't like it. I th I, th I really think it's a great one. Um, and then of course the the splitting it right, the the Europe divided um, look to it. I don't think there was a specific like I don't think she is a, a specific note right. I, you know, other than the, I think it's just a graphic that they got because it, it looked great. Um, one thing I do think, and they did put a lot of time and thought into it, is the board, the map uh, projection. Because it's a challenge, the Caucasus is, is a pretty small region, right, Geogra you know, spatially. So trying to figure out a, a projection that worked, even, even then we had to blow it up a little bit. So you can see that's a yeah. slightly kind of blown up area there. Um, that was a bit of a challenge. But I like what they did, where it's sort of this you know, very different view depending on the side of the board you're sitting on. And I, I think my theory um, is that I think that the face is Europa, the 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 girl from the myth. That's what I would that's mm. the way I interpreted it. And then it has two colors for the two sides of Europe, I guess. So that's right. the but for me that was Europa. But yeah. I, th I think it's a better story than than no story, David. You need yes, to come up yes. with something. Like, Good, with job. A question. Good job. Yes, yes of course. <laughs> of course, it's Europa. Yes. <laughs> How can you not see that? Uh, good. And I already cheated, uh, I realized. Uh, I um, I placed uh, an influence, and I never paid for it. Ooh. But which, you know, I, I'm thinking that in some games, sometimes it is actually thematic to cheat. Um, and I think if, if I can, if I, if I can, if I can get away with it, maybe it's okay. Uh, maybe more in the Robin Hood game, it makes more sense. But I think in this one, why not? Uh, oh, did you mention? I, I don't know. I, I didn't mention up for me. Um, building an army is the only action you ever take in the game that's spatially tied to the country taking the action. I didn't say it, but I was about to because I might or might not be <laughs> at a point where I'm going to build an army. Okay. Uh, donc ça c'est deux. Attends un peu la pression. Deux. Do you speak French, David? No, no. I okay, don't. good. So when I count, you don't know uh, <laughs> how, how, to, how much I'm counting. That's that's good. Yeah. Uh, and yes, Russ, I'm, I'm. Yeah, yeah. I think he knows. He, he probably already saw me cheat a, a few uh, a few times. And and to your point, Russ, about the um, the headline cards, and I was showing them earlier in the stream. They are massive, and I think it looks really nice on the on the board. They were like extra big size tarot cards, which makes the area very easy to see. I think in terms of user experience, it's really nice because it's 
usually when you have those like headlines or shared objective it's it's hard you you pick them you look at them and here it's like it's extremely clear what you're looking at you it, it really pops up what area of the of europe you're looking at and what's going to be important so that's that was a really nice choice i think of of making them that big uh so i have uh and i forgot i think i have five or have seven <laughs> oh okay let me check quickly i think i have five let me check yeah, I have five, so you can go first. Okay. All right, so I'm going to use Austria for two money. I'm going to take two money, and I'm going to use Norway to move this army in Turkey into Armenia. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> so <laughs> annoying. I knew you would do something like this. Okay. Uh... And Pierre is asking uh, so the, for the color coding, so why yellow for Europe. I guess that it was hard to have blue for both NATO and yeah. Europe. So that was, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, yeah, I, I I thought of, you know, you kind of think of yellow, or at least I do, yellow, blue for an EU. And so obviously blue would, I, I would associate more with NATO. So that's, that was kind of the, the where I landed with. So I'm going to build some armies because I need to get rid of that Armenian NATO invasion. Uh, there. So I'm using the military industrial complex. Uh, and this card has a specific thing. So I either use it for the symbols on the side, or you see a last symbol that looks like a file or a folder or something like this. It's actually a special action. And the special action is what is written on the card here. And it tells me that if I spend three coins, I'm going to be able to build uh, two armies um, in the Volga Federal District. And this is pretty nice for me. Uh, because it's the only way for me to not spend two <laughs> to, for each of the things. I'm actually going to spend three and build two armies straight away, which normally would cost me two actions and four. So it's also good economy of action and good economy financially. And I'm planning on using a lot of those armies. So Volga Federal District is here, and that's not that far from Armenia. And I have a question. Is the Caspian Sea an area that I can no. travel through? Ugh. No. Who made this game? I know, I know. <laughs> it's it's a designer. Like, horrible. Uh, so that was my first action. And then uh, I'm going to use the... Uh, uh, but, but Fred, don't, don't forget over where, um, if you ever need to go through it, where the Southern Federal District touches extreme northwestern Georgia, like the Abkhazia area. Yeah. So you can get from Southern Federal District to Georgia in one move. Yeah, yeah, and that's that I saw that, but I, it would have been yeah. cheaper for me to go through the KSPNC. Uh, un, deux, trois, un... No, no, it's actually exactly the same price. So I'm, don't listen to me. I'm saying something <laughs> uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then I'm going to use the news media, not for the special action, but to generate a bit of income. So I'm going to get two coins back. Because yeah, Pierre, news... let's... Pierre, let's not talk about that. I didn't want to. I didn't want to point that out when um, I took that action. So. Uh, okay. So this is this. Uh, yes, and I saw that, and yeah. Good. And I'm going to discard those two cards. And that's the end of our uh, of our turn. Yep. So, so as was indicated on the. On the turn track, we're going to move the, the headlines from forthcoming to current. And now we're going to have to choose one to place in forthcoming. So I'm going to take back my cards. So I'm going to do three of them. And as you might know, in the in the in the live, I really don't want that one to come up <laughs> because this is going to be problematic, and I'm not sure I can prevent that. Uh, oh, I had another plan for you. Hmm, forgot about that. I will already be around there. I actually like that quite a bit. Um, so we put them flipped. Oh, yeah. Ooh, so Georgia and ooh, look at this. Oh, that's so, gonna be super tense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
And so, like, what, I mean, obviously, once you play the game a couple of times, you'll you'll recognize this. But if you knew the history, it would also make sense that the first era is very heavily involved with the the Balkans, the Caucasus, right? Um, and Ukraine to a lesser extent, and then you'll see a ton of Ukraine, um, the Baltics, etc. in the in the second area so, era. So. Okay, and I need to. Okay, wait a minute. Can I? Yeah, I'm gonna drag this card into my hand, and then I don't have any cards anymore, so I'm gonna flip this, put it into my. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I hate the Vertopia so much. It is awful. Come on. Is little deck of card? Yeah. Can I take the whole deck? No, of course not, because Tabletopia is mean and wants me to suffer. Oh no, it's good. Okay, and I draw an extra one. Good. Uh, and once we've played the um, the the headline card, we're gonna draw an additional one. Mm, right. That's did right. you draw one already? I did. I did. Okay. You haven't told me anything. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna remove them from my hand again because they are just taking too much space. I have four cards in hand. Okay, so and now I have only two turns to 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 turn the tide in uh, in Armenia, and that's a bit problematic. I want to remove NATO influence over there, which is it. It is like. What it's representing like it's literally like the country coming to an agreement with nato to accept mm -hmm. uh like base being placed there and everything mm -hmm. so we're gonna have to move some troops and we're gonna oh, have to we completely forgot one minor thing um we have baltic sea cards and black sea cards right yeah so um they haven't mattered yet and they won't matter probably for a little while but they just and we can talk about when it becomes important but when one of the two of us has enough influence around that body of water, we're going to get these cars and their little bonus um, benefits, if you will, for the person that, that has the most influence around the Black or the Baltic Sea. This is going to cost me... Uh, the Three actions and I have four cards. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why, David? Why do you do that? Uh, okay. Quatre. Oh, you're so annoying right now. Et... Oh. Okay, I'm going to take this. It's, I have a ten. Um, and I have seven, so you go first. Okay. I think we are going to move an army. We're going to use, so I have Denmark and Spain and Portugal, again, both of which have a, a pretty wide array of, um, of all the actions. I'm going to move this army from Italy into the Western Balkans. So right now, at least, I'm meeting my conditions to win the Western Balkans. Um, and... I'm going to decide how invested I want to be there. I think I definitely want to win it. So I'm going to move this army from Germany. So it's going to go one for free and then another move. So I have to pay one money for that move because it won one extra space past the free space. Okay. So I'm playing the energy sector to generate some income. And then I have the news media. And the news media event is not that useful for now, for, for that much for now. Uh, not useful that much for now. Just thinking, I think I have a, do I have a plan? <laughs> Yes, I have a plan. I'm going to annoy uh, you a bit. I'm going to use uh, the news media and make a bit of propaganda in the Western Balkans. And I'm going to increase the value of that die from one to four. So you don't meet your victory condition anymore. 
And then with the energy sector, I'm going to spend two to place some influence in Armenia. So even if you are there, at least I'm fulfilling the first part of my victory condition. Armenia is a bit crowded. It needs an overflow box. <laughs> that's, that's, <what> <laughs> <they do. laughs> that's the the feedback that always comes up in playtest. Can you add, add an overflow box? No, no, it's ugly. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Mm, okay, so we moved to, we forgot to move the marker. So we go to turn four, and this is when we're going to decide our, our um, yeah. what do you call it, our headline card for the first time. And this is an example earlier when I talked about wanting to go second. It's almost always better to go second in a turn in which you're scoring your cards because you know you're advantaged by not having to respond to your you know play, playing the um, you know in response not having to play defensively right which can cost a lot of money hmm. uh six set This one should be in the discard pile. Uh, have you chosen your card? Yes. I have seven. I have nine. Yes. Yes. OK, Excellent. I'm going to use Finland for two money. I'm going to use Germany to place NATO influence in Armenia. So that costs the two money I just got. And then I'm going to use the US, US presidential tour. <clears throat> Let's not talk about which president. Uh, we're going to split, split five NATO influence across two. I, I can split flat five NATO influence however I want, but no more than three in any one place. So I'm going to take this one to four. And I'm going to take this one to six. Now I have to take the Western Balkans card. Oh, God. So I put that in my discards. I hate and... you so much right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I cannot have my objective. That's 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 that. Uh, I had I had my whole little plan and it was going to be just perfect. <laughs> Uh, so now I cannot fulfill my objective anymore because I need two moves to have an army in Armenia, which is one of my condition. Because one army coming in Armenia would just delete yours and delete mine, and then moving another one um, would fulfill my condition. But the thing is that you also have more influence. So we need to do three actions. I only have two. Um, and this is... This is a bit problematic. Yeah. I'm going to flip my cards uh, and have the military industrial complex and the southern federal district. OK. So now I need to think. One, two, three. So it's going to cost four. Four to do that. I'm going to be extra mean, and I know that probably the 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 the, the game is not going to go to the end, so I'm going to do it uh, just because out of pure spite. Uh, I'm going to discard that advantage card to get uh, three coins. So now I have five, and I'm going to use my two cards here to actually uh, move armies. <laughs> I'm going to have... Awesome. <laughs> This one moving one, two, and three. So that's going to cost me two. And both our armies are going to be removed. Yeah, I removed one of mine. And then I'm going to move this one. So it's going to go into the Black Sea, then coming here and doing a third move here. And it's going to cost me two and remove your... Also, your victory condition for that yeah. headline card. 
Yeah. It is extremely expensive, very stupid, but I, I just I was so annoyed that you prevented me from doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting about this game is what you'll typically see is players that either deny each other, right? Or they kind of allow each other largely to go for stuff. So um you can have games that are just super low scoring because we're just concentrating completely on denial. So that's the that's what that was. That was great. Yeah, I felt like yeah, it was a waste of uh, of good resources. So now I have to choose another one. Hmm. Actually, I'm gonna calm things down a bit in the Caucasus, and I'm gonna go somewhere else, which is usually somewhere. Right, where I wanted to start my, oh yeah, of course mm. you're 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 taking advantage of your already existing influence in the Western Balkans to to do that horrible horrible behavior. And uh, yeah, I want to restore uh, control over Belarus. Hmm. And I need to discard my cards. That was an extremely expensive turn. <laughs> I'll take a poor Russia. That's a that's a good, good yeah, play for, for me. For you, it's it's really good actually. The fact that I'm so poor. Yeah. And I need to draw, so I'm gonna get one, and I'm gonna reshuffle through my deck again, which my deck is still extremely small. Because I haven't taken control of any uh, country yet. And I'm going to shuffle and draw a card. Oh, and we have James who had to uh, to leave. So have a good evening, James. And thanks for joining us while we were there just to see me complain about David. <laughs> Ah, uh, good. And the other James, so we have a, uh, yeah, we're losing all of our James. So <laughs> all, all the James are going away. See you, James. And we are in turn six. Good. Hmm. Uh, no, we're in turn five. And I guess maybe we can go to turn six. Uh, yeah. Time is it. And we can, uh, we can debrief. So we won't go through the, through the, through the whole game. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, am I even able to fulfill my objective that is going to come in turn six? That seems unreasonable. Il va me falloir combien? Un, deux, trois. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of actions. Uh, Yeah, so my initiative level for this turn is going to be 12. I've got eight. Good. So you go first. Oh, well, I go first. You go Sorry. first, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to use the president to generate a bit of income. I don't know what he does, uh, just waving around, generating cash, or <laughs> he's doing that so that's four and i definitely need those four and then the other thing that i'm going to do is spend two straight away to this time plan a bit more ahead and place one die in georgia this is my turn i'm going to play um turkey i'm going to build a new army in turkey i'm going to keep the pressure on down in the caucuses so spend two money for that and then um, Greece is going to allow me to move an army. I've got to get an army back in Western Balkans. So, so I'm going to go from. We'll go from Spain and Portugal. So it'll be one, two, three. So I've got to spend two money for that. 
Mm. Oh yeah, because th those are two. Yeah, the Mediterranean is actually two separate zones. Okay. Yeah. One, two, three. Did I give myself too money, or I don't know if somebody was watching. I don't know. I may have just given myself too money instead of spending it to build an army. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, I think I surprised. did. I think I, I'm pretty sure I just cheated. <laughs> but that's in the spirit of the game. It's <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, that's it for me. So we are on turn six. And it's for you, you had mentioned this earlier, but just to kind of bring the point home for people, I'm just now for the first time shuffling my deck. And you've shuffled your deck twice. Twice already. Time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really close to shuffle it another time. Oh, and Pierre is going also. See you, Pierre. Thanks for being there. He's going to use it in his class about critical geopolitics through board games. Oh, that's you awesome. know, and I, and I'm looking at this, and I was I'm thinking, where were those classes when I was at university? You know, it's like, like the, why, how? <laughs> I want to play the yeah. I would have loved to do that. Uh, my initiative level is nine. I've got thirteen. Okay, so so the first thing I'm going to do is play this USA card. So I can spend three money, and for every money up to three money, but for each money I spend, I can place EU influence and increase it to two. So I'm going to do that in Azerbaijan and Georgia. Oh. So I'm going to go here, and here. And I'm going to play Italy to increase this to six, and the United Kingdom to increase this to six. And then I've got to take both of those cards, which I really don't want to do. They're horrible, but I'm trying to get some points. Yeah, and and now you you add them to your to your discard. It's not a bad time for you to add them no. to your discard because you just reshuffled. So that's right. Yeah, they're going to be a problem. Uh, later down the line. Okay, that's it for me. Ah, oh, you really got me on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think I can beat that. I really don't. Hmm. Oh, my plan is not that great now. Um... So originally I wanted to move an army into Georgia and that will knock you down. Now that would only knock you down to five. So so keep in mind to beat your to get yours though, you don't have you you've just gotta have an army in there, right? So you'd have to move two armies in there. Because I don't have NATO influence in there at all. Oh yeah, that's true. You need NATO influence, so I need to move two. Yeah. Uh the, and that would oh yeah, okay. But then, yeah, and I can move armies with two of them. And that's what I'm going to do. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to, instead, I'm going to change my plan and I'm going to pay one because this is going to be, uh, it's a move of two, one and two. So we are going to cancel each other out. And then I'm going to use the other one to move. So that's going to cost me another coin. And this army is going to come in. It's going to station here. Now, the other good thing you do, I mean, obviously we've got four turns until we score, but uh, I don't know if people remember or not, but I mentioned that when we score at turn 10, we score one victory point for every place we have a six. So you're denying me a point during 
points yeah. for and by doing that. So it's, it's good. Okay, so we would resolve these. So I score and you score. So I score three and you'd score two. And you do have a, an extra benefit from uh, from this one, right? So when you... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we put a little, I don't know if they have them in here, but we put a little coin token on um, Azerbaijan and Georgia, right? And so now what that means is that in its, what was the, what are we doing here? Oh, we're building the BTC pipeline. So that the oil pipeline running from Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan. And so now either, either uh, if either of us uses Azerbaijan or Georgia for money, we get an extra money when we take that action, representing the completion of the of the pipeline. Oh, is it for both of us? Yes. Yep. So oh, when you great. usually anytime you get one of those bonus money um, actions, regardless of the player that conducted the action, both players get to take the advantage of it. Okay, but that's great to know. Uh, well, so I have those cards in my hand now, but um, that's probably something I need to look into. <laughs> So I think that for people, I mean, so what people didn't get to see, if we, you know, we call it, well, obviously we would advance the headlines, we'd put a couple new ones. Um, when we get to turn eight, we would go ahead and score headlines just like we've been doing. Um, but the, the only slight difference there is we're actually going to th throw away a card, one of the headline cards that we had held, held in our hands. And so what that means is it gives you the opportunity to hold on to a headline usually of your opponent that you don't want to ever put into play. So that's kind of nice. And then we're going to draw headlines for the, um, the. Yeah. For per two that was two. starting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so then we'll start on era two. It's all the stuff from, like I said, 2008 on, then we'll score on turn 10 and then we go to turn 20 basically and, and keep playing until we score a second time. And just for, for to illustrate, so that was one of those cards that I was planning on keeping in my hand up until mm -hmm. turn eight to actually discard it because uh, I didn't want you to score the Southeast European cooperation process for, uh, yeah, uh, okay. that would have been a lot and you were already in a pretty good position to uh, to have it. So, yeah. Oh, actually not that much because you needed Europe influence. That's one thing that I, that I, that I, that I tend to forget. The mm -hmm. dynamic between blue and uh, and yellow cubes. Yeah, I often tell players um, if if you are in a situation where one player is teaching the other player, the player that's familiar with the game should always play Europe because it's the the two sides are pretty well balanced once players have played the game. But um, it's much you know the, the Europe player has a little bit more to think about, right? And that they have to remember, you know, you can't you have to they have the different uh, requirements to meet. But more importantly, you you sometimes forget. Oh, I can't actually take an EU power with this contested country that only I only have NATO influence in, or whatever. So, and you can see that's that's already going to be a problem for me, right? Like in my deck right now, if we continued on, I could only use my Azerbaijan and Georgia cards, which are already bad enough for yeah. EU actions, and I can only take my uh, use my Western Balkans card for NATO actions. Yeah, and you were going to get yeah way more uh, yeah less useful yeah. cards in your deck right now. But cool. Thanks for uh, for the uh, explanation of the of the rules. Um, I, I I would like to maybe take the the last ten minutes to uh, to either uh, take questions from the chat and and also talk a bit about your upcoming projects, um, if uh, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, and we just had a comment from Alan that was actually, oh yes, saying that the uh, use of armies is reminiscent of diplomacy, uh, but is more sophisticated and nuanced. Uh, actually, there is navies uh, because yeah, uh, no navies or airport are there. There is navies, and I'm going to show the counter. So, but those are special uh, cards, I think. Yeah. So you have navies counter for I think for the Baltics and the right. and the and the Black Sea, right? Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, the 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 Baltic, all all of the all of the sea and ocean spaces are just like land spaces. So only one person can have be be present physically present in it but like i said earlier if you have the most influence like like now that i'm on um uh in georgia with five influence the eu would get the uh black sea card and and it actually distinguishes between the eu and nato in this case so so if it, you can have this interesting situation where the the europe player is trying to balance do i want the eu or nato to have the 
the dominating influence in the location. And so, for example, um, the power that the EU gains by by having the most influence there is they get two extra money when using an EU action with the Eastern Balkans, Georgia, or Ukraine. So it's interesting, this Georgia card right now, if I used it for money, would get its base money value plus one because it's got a bonus from that uh, headline, plus two more from, from the Black Sea influence. Um, so it's it's a pretty abstracted notion, but there is this idea of, of naval dominance in you know either either merchant or navy in um, the Black Sea and the Baltic Sea. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, if, if you think about it, like these are not these are absolutely not representing you know mechanized armies or navies or, or air forces, just representing the a, a military presence somewhere. And that's actually something that I thought was really interesting in, 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 in the game, this idea that you had two different kinds of influence and they could uh, intertwine together and this idea that yeah, military is an extension of geopolitics and not, uh, but that there are two separate things, but they are just playing around with each other, which I thought was a really interesting part of the, of the game. So that was pretty cool. Um, so that was your first uh, CDG, we could say. Do, would you qualify in Dr. Normandy? Yes, I would qualify it as a as a card driven game, but but I don't know if everyone would agree. Yeah. But in a very different, you know, it's a very different kind of um, of card driven game. But like re exploring that design and thinking about it, did it give you an appetite to make uh, other games of that uh, of that type? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I mean, um, for better or worse, I'm I'm in the position right now where I'm getting. Um, commissions or requests from companies, in which doesn't allow me to really uh, explore ideas as much as I want, right? So like Osprey wants us to continue doing Undaunted, DVG wants me to continue doing Valiant Defense, etc. So I haven't had a ton of time to just say, hey, what do I want to do selfishly? Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of exploring the CDG space, but I think that, you know, everything from... Um, Judean Hammer, which I think is fantastic. Uh, um, like I said before, 13 Days, Watergate. They do it so well that I wouldn't want to do a CDG just for the sake of doing it, right? And so I'd have to think of something like, okay, well, what, what am I bringing that hasn't already been done that's, that's you know, special in some way? So I, I definitely am interested in doing it, but I've got to come up with something that I think is, is there's a reason to do it and it, and it feels different than what's been done before. Yeah. And you were talking about Undaunted and the fact that you were developing the series. Isn't it one of the way maybe to, um, like you, you've seen other publishers doing about there is a system and then you let other um, designer expand it and just making sure that you have an overview on the on the development, the themes and what is being brought to the series, but more becoming a series designer and being able to focus more on, on projects that you are more interested yeah. in exploring. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. Um, I haven't told anybody this before, but... Um, we are trying that with the Valiant Defense Series with DVG. So there is in work right now uh, a design that's that was conceptualized by somebody other than me. I'll help with the development on it. Um, uh, hopefully, I, I, it's looking really good. So I, I won't talk about the specifics about what it is. Yeah. I'll let the designer do that when it comes time for it. But um, for Undaunted, I've had different people reach out to me with proposals. Hey, what about what do you think about this? I think it's cool. Um, it's ultimately up to Osprey if they want to to go with you know. Thus far, they've wanted to do one on un, one undaunted game a year, right? And yeah. if it just if it stays at that, I'll probably continue to do it as long as you know we're interested. Myself and Trevor Benjamin, the co designer, um, but I, I have no issues with it at all. I think it would be great if you know other people take on the system. Yeah, because it definitely undaunted. I see a. A massive space to explore different scenarios, different kind of units, and different things. Especially as with North Africa, you showed that you could have different scales within the same system. Yeah. And I was expecting like it could be like not endless, of course, but there is a lot of different topics uh, that that could be explored. And I think so, it so would be I'll, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will say, um, Osprey is by far the most um, well organized of any publisher in like projecting things out. So we've actually completed the design work for the next three games in the series, right? So oh. including nor including reinforcements. So reinforcements is done, you know, it comes out in a couple months, a few months. Um, but then summer of 22, summer of 23, that's already all done. Um, and so 
the one thing I'll say about that is I kind of agree with what you're like. It, the next games in the series, they need to be something different. We can't, mm-hmm. it's not just a reskin of what's already existed. And so, um, fortunately, the system allows for that. So each each game is is bringing something pretty different to, to the table for the first time, which is, I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah. And I think that would be, I'm really looking forward. And, and as you know, I love Untaunted uh, Normandy. Uh, I haven't, uh, I just only touched, scratched the surface of North Africa and reinforcements. Uh, I really love the multiplayer dynamic of reinforcement, yeah. and that way I would like to I would like to see it grow even beyond that. And I think it's a it's a really cool. I don't know. It's a, I re- actually I, I think it's a great system. So seeing it grow beyond that would be really awesome. I have one request: Is there any way to have a vessel module for Undaunted? Because it's like playing it on TTS is just a, a massive pain. I would like to be <laughs> played to play it live on the show. I would like to 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 play it a little more. Um, in a in in an environment that will require less resources for my computer, is there anything that we could discuss with Osprey to have a? I think um, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Uh, no one's okay. watching. It's I'm fine. just going to. I'm going to. I will. I'll just have to ask uh, Osprey for forgiveness when I'm about to say. I think if you go to Osprey and you ask for permission to do a Vassal mod, because Osprey, the board game publisher is a very small part of Osprey and Osprey is owned by a big book company. Yeah. I don't, I think it's almost impossible to get permission to do that, to yeah. do a vassal mod, like official permission. I think if I was a person and I wanted to do something like that, I think I would just do it and not ask for permission. Maybe <laughs> this is very nutty. David. <laughs> <This> is... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I understand your point. It's true that th- those those types of companies they are very yeah. stricter with the managing the the rights of reproduction and everything, especially in the book yeah. in, in in the book industry. So I understand that, but it would be it would be so good if we if we had a yeah if we had a vessel module, not a tabletopia one, a vessel module. Not a tabletopia. Be, I, I wouldn't. Oh gosh. Oh. But, so uh, let me yeah. let me put it this way: if you think it's if you think it's uh, tedious to play Undaunted on Tabletop Simulator. I can tell you that the entirety of Undaunted Reinforcements, the entirety of Undaunted North Africa, and the vast majority of Normandy was developed on exclusively on Tabletop Simulator. Yeah. Like every moment of it, right? So, yeah. And that's the thing. In the end, uh, I think the, the – the, and just for the people who are out there, I don't know if the person who, who – or someone who made the module for on TTS for, for Undotted uh, Normandy is going to see that. The modules are great. Don't yeah. get me wrong. I think they're extremely well made. The yeah. scenarios are automatic setup. It's really amazing. Amazing work. I think it's really cool. Just that. <laughs> Like if I want to stream or if I don't want my computer to uh, to catch fire, like it's better for me to play on Vassal. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the modules are awesome. But uh, yeah. Anyway, it was really great for for you to to actually uh, uh, come tonight and and, and teach uh, Europe Divided. I think it's a super interesting game. Um, and uh, I have actually a couple of people who reached out after I started talking about it on Twitter to have a a couple of games. So I would be more than happy to uh, to have. Uh, Online game, so if you want to try it, reach out and we uh, we have a game. There is also a very good um, TTS module for this one. But if I don't have to stream, we can play it on TTS. Uh, that's uh, that's fine. But uh, yeah, thanks again for for that. Any final comments? Anything, David, that you wanted to? Oh gosh, uh, yeah, I guess not. Yeah, if there's no other question, I mean, the, um, I can't remember. I mean, I. I think the one thing that, that some people might be interested to know is that I'm working on a game with Salt and Pepper. Do you know them? Uh, yes. A, yeah. Yeah. So so they reached out to me and asked me to design a game for them. Um, historically, they've only done translations, right? So they've taken on um, mostly English language stuff and translated it into Spanish. So we're doing a game for Salt and Pepper. I think I can. I don't know if they've announced this or not. So I, I'll tell you. And again, I'll get in trouble if I if I spill the beans but um we're doing a game about the spanish maquis which is not something that a lot of people know about right everybody knows about the french maquis um and and you know it's i wanted it to be a game since we're doing it for a spanish publisher that that was that paid homage to that uh time period that group of people and i'm doing it with trevor benjamin who's a guy i work with undaunted um and then roger tankersley who i worked with him on um sniper elite 
and we've got another game coming out together that hasn't been announced yet. So uh, I just I'm excited about it because it's a, a relatively small publisher. It's the first time working with them. They've been awesome. The artist is um, he actually worked on the graphic novel adaptation of um, Slaughterhouse Five. So that's oh, you know yeah that's uh, really cool. Just yeah, really you know just the, the the coolest thing about this hobby is like getting to meet new people and having th the opportunity to collaborate with people like that that you never thought you'd be able to so mm. i'm excited about that for sure yeah that's pretty awesome but thanks for for sharing that and i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um that's great uh i have some ideas for an undoted so i will give yeah. you i will send you a list of things that yeah. i think you should do uh just maybe one reminder before we go remember that uh, next week we'll be meeting for uh, book club volume two so episode number two and we'll be talking about when titans clash with a uh, an amazing panel of guests. Uh, so join us next Sunday, the 5th, to talk about when Titans clashed and how recent research on the East Front had an impact on wargaming over the last couple of decades. Uh, and you were there for the first book club. Uh, yeah, and you can absolutely. you can say that it was extremely fun and that you that you it was fantastic. Yeah, I had a great time. Yeah. Was, so that's an I, awesome lineup. So yeah, yeah, it, it, I think that's what makes the value of those book clubs is, is having a good panel. I, I wasn't sure we'd do a volume two. It was extremely painful to organize one, and I'm pretty happy we did. I'm not, I'm not sure there would be a volume three, so, so we'll see about that. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was great to have you on the show. I want to thank everyone for joining us um, tonight. Uh, we're getting very close to the 2,000 subscribers, so thanks again for everyone for uh, sharing, liking, leaving some comments. That's, that's really nice. We're really building a, a, a nice community here so i'm pretty happy about that uh, so thanks everyone have a good evening and see you next week bye bye